Hi there, everybody. Mr. Lewis here with your first video lecture of the semester for AP Microeconomics. And today's lecture is going to focus on Unit 1, Basic Economic Concepts. And some of these basic economic concepts uh, are going to be a little tricky at first, but they're foundational things that we need to understand and get a grip on before we can move into some of the more complex topics. So what's included in Unit 1? Unit 1 is essentially an introduction to things like scarcity, resources, scarce resources, how these scarce resources are used to fill unlimited wants and needs within a population. So we're going to talk about basic production, uh, the production possibilities that are uh, um, capable within one pool of resources for a group or a a country, a business, an individual, whatever it might be. We're also going to look at things like trade and how different countries or, again, groups, individuals, whatever it might be, uh, decide what to focus their resources on because you can make a lot of stuff using basic resources. So how do we determine what to make? And a lot of it comes down to supply and demand. Then it comes down to costs and benefits. Where are we going to make the most profit? What is going to benefit our company or our country or ourselves the most? So today specifically, we're going to talk about 1.1, which is scarcity. 1.2, which gets into resource allocation and types of economies, economic systems, a market economy versus a command economy or somewhere in between. And then we're also going to look at, and this is the, the bulk of today's lesson, uh, the production possibilities curve. The production possibilities curve is this model, it's a graph that we use to assess and analyze production decisions and resource allocation decisions. So without further ado, let's dive into it. Okay, so Unit 1, Basic Economic Concepts. Here's a list of all the different sections. There's only six of them in Unit 1. 1 1.1, 1 1.2, and 1.3 I already briefly mentioned, but 1.4, which we're going to get into later along with 1.5 and 6. Uh, 1.4 is called Comparative Advantage and Trade. So after looking at resource allocation and production possibilities today, Later this week, we're going to look at where are the advantages and then how do you take those advantages and turn it into profitable, beneficial trade. Then we'll look at how do we actually weigh those decisions, the costs and the benefits uh, associated with any type of market activity, production or otherwise. And then finally, marginal analysis, which is a very, very important uh, foundational tool that we're going to use for the rest of the semester and consumer choice. So we're not just going to talk about the production side of things in this unit. We will also get into consumers and how consumers make their decisions through cost-benefit analyses. All right, so 1.1, we, we've already talked just a bit about scarcity, but we, we still have to uh, set the table here. So economics, the whole study of economics, is defined by this concept of scarcity. Scarcity means that there are limited resources available to meet the unlimited wants and needs of a given population. So if we didn't, excuse me, if we didn't have to make uh, decisions about how to use, use scarce resources, then the study of economics wouldn't really exist. If, if everything was just uh, very plentiful and, and unlimited, we wouldn't have to make these cost-benefit uh, decisions and analyses. So the central question is, who decides how to allocate scarce resources, how much those resources should cost, uh, uh, what goods should get produced, how much those goods should cost, all of those things. And that gets into section 1.2, resource allocation and economic systems. The way a particular government or group or whatever decides to allocate resources says a lot about their economic system. That is essentially their economic system. However they decide what gets made, who gets to consume it, all those things, that determines whether they are a market system, a command system, or somewhere in between, what we call mixed. And again, those, those essential questions are, what gets produced? What goods and services are produced? How are those goods and services made? 
and then who gets to consume them and, and how much do they have to pay for them, basically. So there's different ways to answer these questions, right? The government might say, well, we're just going to take care of all of that. And that would be a command system. Whereas uh, another government might say, well, we're just going to let all the people determine that on their own. We're not going to tell them what to make and what to consume. That would be the market system. In reality, most systems are pretty mixed. You can see up in this chart here, uh, kind of a sweet three-part Venn diagram. So the free market in Singapore, for example, it's a, it's a very, very free market, meaning the government very, very uh, seldom and in minor ways limits business. So they're very laissez-faire, as we would say. They're efficient. They're, there's great efficiency because the, the free market responds to that efficiency. Supply and demand are allowed to act as they see fit in this market without much government control. But there's big gaps in income and there's a lot of poverty, right? So there's a lot of wealth at the top, but there's also a lot of poverty and there's big gaps between those two. Something that we experience here in the United States as well. In a command system such as Cuba, okay, it's very inefficient. The government trying to manage all the supply and demand, the needs and wants for an entire country, is seldom effective. And we've seen that in many examples across the world and across history. Uh, however, it is quite equal. So, so it may not be perfectly efficient and responsive, but you don't have those giant gaps between rich and poor. Okay, now in some command economies, you still do end up having those big gaps, but the idea is that if it works out perfectly, okay, such as the command economy in Cuba, which is a communist system, um, everyone should roughly get the same amount. You know, people who uh, have a lower income are taken care of so that they can put food on the table and, and everything is balanced out, so to speak. Whereas in a mixed system, such as France's uh, economic system, you kind of have elements of both free market and command economies. Okay, so here is that on a bigger scale, if you want to take another look at that. But then there's another spectrum that we have here, the command economy versus the mix versus the market. And it's giving you some examples of uh, these different systems and how close different countries are to either side of the spectrum. So this would be the pure free market, pure competition with no government intervention in any way. We're close to that. We're not all the way in the United States because the government does play some, some controls on different markets and, and they provide certain things for people. There's welfare, there's uh, public education, all of those things. On the left here, we have pure planned economies, which is a command system. Uh, the closest, closest example, really, uh, as far as being on the end of the spectrum, Cuba is one example, North Korea was another. And then you can see that some of the countries are right in the middle, right? France and Sweden are kind of uh, smack dab in the middle there. And that's why they, uh, on the last slide, call France um, a, a socialist system because it is in the middle. It's a mixed economy. And most economies are. You can even see China and Venezuela, which are two classic uh, communist examples or socialist examples, I should say. But even those two are not as far left over here as North Korea. China has introduced some uh, free market ideas or capitalist ideas into their economy over the last uh, roughly half century. So, once you have your system laid out, now we need a way to assess and analyze the decisions made within that system. Economists, whether it's a, a command economy or a free market economy, need some type of model. We need some figure, a graph, with which we can assess those decisions about resource allocation. And this is where the production possibility curve comes in, which is often referred to as the PPC. Guns versus butter is a classic example of a government trying to make a decision between two things. And you'll see why that's so important in a moment, but bear with me. So guns versus butter, here's what it represents. It's actually an analogy, okay? It's saying that a government has only so many resources, money, whatever it might be, to put toward foreign investment and national defense, guns in this case, or domestic investments that's going to put 
butter on people's plates, so to speak. So it's really just an example of our production possibilities curve. Here's a basic, basic example of this curve. We have a y-axis and an x-axis. And on either axis, you've got a good, okay, a product. On the y-axis, we've got guns that can be produced. On the x-axis, we've got butter. And I promise you, this is a classic economic example. Guns versus butter, I'm not making this up. Um, this is something that's been used for, for many, many decades to describe the exact situation that we're um, detailing today and analyzing today. You can either put your resources here on the y-axis or here, but you have to split them up if you want to make both. And that's what this curve represents. This is our production. We can make as much butter as we want, okay, as we can, I should say, but that would put all of our resources into butter and we wouldn't be making any guns. Or the government could say, we're gonna put all of our resources into um, you know, defense this year and we're gonna make as many guns as possible, but that's gonna leave zero resources left for butter. So the, the tricky part is striking the right balance, right? And, and here's essentially what we're dealing with. You've got this giant pool of resources, factors of production, that we can use to make one of two goods. In this case, let's say we have a literal pool of water that can be used to make either bottles of Dasani or bottles of this little gem, Wada, which if you notice has the uh, uh, label with lightning bolts on it. I think that's really clever. But anyway, whoever's making this water has to decide how many of these to make and how many of these to make. But they only have 5,000 gallons of water with which they can work. So how do we efficiently break down these decisions? We use the production possibilities curve. It's used to analyze the resources available or factors of production, the potential of those resources, that's where possibilities comes in, which is measured as output, quantity, uh, number of units that are being produced, and then of course the efficiency with which we're allocating our resources. And it can only be one of three things. It's either efficient, inefficient, or just not possible. Okay, efficient would be maximizing our capabilities. Inefficient would be wasting some resources, leaving things unused. And then impossible would just be, we don't have enough resources to make that happen. Now, let's take a look at the PPC. Okay, there are several different pieces of this figure that you need to be aware of. One is whatever good is being produced on the y-axis, in this case, food. Two, whatever good is being produced on the x-axis, in this case, clothing. The next thing you should be aware of is sometimes there will be a maximum amount listed, okay? That would be all the way up on the very end of the curve. So what this is telling us here is that if we put, we being the producer, okay, whatever this might be, uh, if this is a, a country or a company, whatever, we know they're making food and clothing and that these are the resources they're working with in this, in this big curve here. If they put all of their resources into only food production, so we're making zero units of clothing, that means we can make 100 units of food. But as soon as we start making any clothing at all, now we're moving rightward along this curve. Because if we're making clothing, that means we're gaining on the x-axis, right? But in order to make clothing, we also end up moving downward along this curve. And that means we're losing on the y-axis. So we have to scale this, we have to balance it. If we wanna make more clothes, we have to give up food. If we wanna make more food, we have to give up clothing. So there's a few other points I want you to be aware of here. Uh, we can see that they are giving us some points of production along the x-axis, just not the maximum, which would be at point A, but we know it's more than 150.
The curve itself, the actual solid line of the curve, is called the production frontier, meaning it's as far as we can go. It's the most we can produce with a given set of resources currently available. Okay? So points C and D are on that production frontier. These are both efficient production combinations. They're both on the curve. Nothing is being wasted. We don't know if one is better than the other necessarily. On, at point C, we're producing 75 units of food and 100 units of clothing. At point D, we're producing 50 units of food and 150 units of clothing. One is not necessarily better than the other. They're both efficient because they both fall on the frontier. Okay, the other two points are F, which is impossible because it's outside the curve. We don't have enough resources to expand production. Now, this is key. We could one day have enough resources for this production. This curve can expand, right? It can move outward. If we get more factors of production, more capital, more labor, something like that, this curve could eventually expand. Or maybe they come up with a better way to produce food more efficiently. They come up with a better way to produce clothing. It might expand this production curve. And of course, the opposite could happen too. Now point E, our last point, is inefficient. This is um, inefficient because we know that there's wasted resources. If, if we're only producing here at point E, we're not making the most of our potential. We're not on the frontier. We're inside it, meaning there's some resources that are just going to waste here, and that's never a good thing. So we can either fall inside the curve, which is inefficient, on the curve, which is efficient, or outside the curve, which is impossible. Here's how we use the production possibilities curve, and here are some of the questions that you may be asked. One, what is the benefit of shifting production allocation from point C to point D? Well, if we look at point C, you can right away see that if we go from there down to point D, we're moving downward, right? So the benefit is not going to be measured on the y-axis because we're moving down. It's going to be measured on the x-axis. At point C, we're at 100 units of clothing. At point D, we're at 150 units of clothing. So we gained 50 units of clothing by making that decision, by shifting allocation from, excuse me, uh, allocating resources, shifting our resources from point C to point D, we gained 50 units of clothing. So that's our answer. Now, you could also think of it the opposite direction. Okay, when we go from point C to point D, it's not all good. We have to give something up to make that happen. At point C, we were making 75 units of food. But at point D, we're only making 50 units of food. So this government now is able to put more clothing on its people's backs, but we have less food to put on their table. It's a trade-off, and we don't know if the trade-off is worth it necessarily right now, but the cost of shifting production from point C to point D, or what we call opportunity cost, okay, it's what we're giving up. It's not a dollar value. It's what we're sacrificing when we go from point C to point D is 25 units of food, 75 to 50, we lost 25 units of food. So here's another example, just so you have something to work off of. When we go from point A to point B, you can see that we are losing 40 units of wheat because we were at 200 and now we're at 160 in order to gain 300 to 400, 100, the difference, 100 units of cotton. So this is a, a farming decision, right? We only have so much land. We only have so much labor. We're sacrificing wheat during this season to grow more cotton. Uh, if there is an exact trade-off, so let's say you are told that 
producing one car is the same as producing two computers. So there is a consistent trade-off. For every additional car you want to produce, you have to give up two computers. Well, now we're going to have a production possibility curve that's not so curvy, right? It's going to look like this because there is a consistent slope. There's a consistent trade-off or ratio. Lose a car, gain two computers. Lose a car, gain two computers. Lose a car, gain two computers, and so on and so forth. So we end up with actually a linear production possibilities curve. Here's a helpful video. If any of this doesn't make sense, uh, this is definitely a, a great resource when, when you um, are going through any topic. Mr. Clifford, who makes these videos called ACDC Econ, is phenomenal. He's, he's a great speaker. Uh, there's lots of visuals and graphs to go with the stuff that he's reviewing. And remember, these are all the same concepts. And you can even see in his, his title here, these are the same topics that are going to be covered from classroom to classroom around the country. We have the same AP course guide that other people are using. So it even says micro topic 1.3, which is exactly what we're on. So there's always other resources out there that might be able to help you if I'm not quite getting the job done. And, and of course, always reach out to me if you need anything. But I'll also put some of these helpful videos in here just for additional support. And you can watch Mr. Clifford later. In fact, one of the things he's showing here is how the production possibility curve can shift outward as we, as we discussed. So it might be worth your time uh, to do that. So all I'm asking is that you take a moment and uh, challenge yourself with these new skills and uh, go into Buzz, select the Level Up Challenge, PPCs, Production Possibility Curves, and see what you can do. The way the Level Up Challenges are going to work is there are four levels. Okay, You'll work from levels one to four, and they will get more difficult as you go. Level two won't open up until you get 100% on level one. Level three won't open up until you get 100% on level two, and level four won't open up until you get 100% on level three. So you have to master each level before you can go to the, the more challenging one. Okay, everyone, that's it for your very first official AP Micro lecture. Remember, all of those Google Slides are available in Buzz for you, okay? All the notes we ever go through will be in there. You don't need to rush and copy everything down. You can take your own notes as you see fit. Please, if there are any questions, concerns, clarifications that need to be made, do not hesitate to contact me, especially if you are a virtual learner. If you're an in-person learner, we might be able to go through some of these things the next day that you're in. However, make sure you're making an honest attempt the very first time these all get assigned. They will accept late work. Everything is set to accept late submissions, and it's not going to count you off. You have unlimited attempts on practice activities like the Level Up Challenge that you're doing today. However, Please, again, make an honest attempt as soon as you can so that if there are any issues or if there is some confusion, we can work on those things and we can master those skills before we move on to other items which, which might be more complex and we need the foundation that we're building now to do well later. With that said, on your level up challenge, uh, the way these are set up, they're going to be four levels each. So you have to get 100% on level one to move to level two. 100% on level two to move to level three, to move to level four, so on and so forth. And for each one, you have unlimited attempts, as I mentioned, and uh, it's set to get a little more challenging as you go. So that by the time you get to level four, you're really seeing some AP exam style questions that uh, you can start to prepare yourself with and, and know that uh, you've got everything under your belt, all the skills and, and concepts uh, that you need to do well on that exam. So again, if there are any issues, concerns, questions, please feel free to reach out as soon as possible and I'll do everything I can to make that stuff clear. All right, thanks everyone. See you next time.